Start by saying that whenever sanctions are imposed on a member of OPEC, uh, we uh, we are usually not very happy. We, we think um, consultative and discussing um, uh, you know, uh, uh, negotiation engagements are the best ways to resolve some of these issues. So we hope somehow uh, both America and Iran will find their way out of the current impasse. But having said that, in terms of its impact, the, the pro projection most people have is that with Iran exiting uh, some substantial volume of its supply out to the market because of the sanctions that you therefore here have in near scarcity and so it will impact on prices and prices will jump up. The, the, the behavioral dynamics of pricing over the last three, four weeks is not, it's not replicating that. We we'll need to see what happens over the next one week. Uh, two things are certain. Uh, OPEC does have, um, uh, some members of OPEC at least does have the capacity uh, to, to Im improve on its, in its production and so hopefully cover some of that gap. Uh, two, however, is that um, ability to cover it in a 100% basis is, is a bit uncertain. Um, some of the idle capacities that people rely on do not just come into the production almost immediately. They require investment, they require time, uh, they require resurgence. And so it's not something that you can turn off and turn on almost to the hands of a tap. Uh, and so definitely, if uh, depend on how much of an impact the, the sanctions have on Iran in terms of its production capacity, you may see a bit of a bit of effect in the market. If or not, in the whole, the whole, the the, the, the entire um, entire um, uh, uh, what would I call entire confidence, at least in the market, will, will obviously be touched. I do I do I do say that because Iran has gone through this before uh, for a very long time. When I visited Iran about two years ago, what I one of the things that impressed me was that they had been able to find a way. Uh, of relying on local um, technology um, uh, to bring up their production. Probably not at the same rate as they would have, obviously. Uh, they have also been able to enter into very good relationships with the rest of the European countries, uh, um, France, Britain, Germany, uh, and so we're able uh, at the time you know, um, to find alternatives uh, to the American technology, which was predominant in Iran. Uh, this current um, embargo is a lot more engulfing because it has the financial nexus, it has the technology nexus, it has an export nexus. And so to what extent they'll be able to sort of navigate around that is obviously uh, uncertain. We'd like to see, but, but the, the Iranian people are very resilient. I want to believe the impact shouldn't be too dramatic. I also want to believe that the impact in the market shouldn't be too destabilizing. But in the event that it becomes critical, I think OPEC will try and rise to the challenge. So let's look at divestment of international oil companies from Nigeria. What opportunities does this offer local companies and um, for local content? I, I think the Nigerian uh, oil, domestic oil companies have risen quite a lot to the challenge. Over the last uh, five, six years, there's been a lot of divestment um, uh, from marginal blocks or so non-actually active blocks from the majors. Of course, there is, there is also a program of government in being able to take over idle fields after a certain time when there is no production. Um, it's called the concept of relinquishment. Um, and we've been able to take that, put it into the marginal field basket, and reward the marginal field basket largest Nigerian domestic companies. Uh, the more bullish ones have gone to the oil companies themselves and negotiated um, um, takeover um, um, fields, uh, which runs into billions. So when you look at total domestic production in the environment of our total global production in Nigeria, uh, it's probably, the MPDC alone is about 250,000 barrels. Other, other producers match together probably at original between uh, about under 200,000 barrels. So you're looking at about 400, 500,000 barrels mix of local domestic capacity production. I, I think that uh, with a lot more active relinquishment program, with a lot more active backing right program in Nigeria, and with the sort of bullishness that I see uh, Nigerian investors willing to put in into the oil sector, um, you probably uh, I want to see another 500,000 barrels potentials between NPDC and the other domestic producers over the next uh, four, uh, four years, in which case you're going to bring domestic capacity to close to about a million barrels, which is really where I should be. Uh, it should be in a regime of about 2.5 2 to 3 million barrels production. So lots of um, um, aggressiveness. No special incentives are yet, and we need to begin to look at what we need to do to incentivize domestic producers, uh, because that's the only way they're going to grow. Uh, access to fund is critical. They do not have as much reach to funds as uh, the, the major producers have. Uh, but um, because of the success of some of those who have gone in, the likes of Seplite on the right, right of them, first, first, uh, first um, Petroleum and the rest, 
uh, people are beginning to have a lot more investors and financiers are beginning to have a lot more faith in Nigerian producers and giving them money to be able to buy into some of these acreages, especially when the reserve the reserve numbers justify those. And what about the Dangote refinery? I'm as excited as uh, Dangote himself on, on that, uh, largely because of the, the domestic refining challenges that we have in Nigeria. Uh, you know we're in the process of revamping about four or five uh, four or five refineries that are owned by the National Oil Company and MPC uh, to bring their um, nameplate capacity back to about 450,000 barrels a day. Dangote is looking at 600, 650,000 barrels a day. Uh, current projections of of um, um, being in the market is probably in the 20, 20, late 2020, early 2021. Um, if we do that, like I said uh, at the conference, you will suddenly see us move from less than 100,000 barrels um, um, capacity um, uh, uh, currently to about a million point one, a million point two um, barrels capacity, self-sufficiency in terms of refined product, capacity to be able to be a net exporter of refined petroleum product. So we're very excited about it, not just because of the work, not just because of the huge, huge modern day technology. It's, it's probably going to be one of the latest technology um, uh, refineries, technological driven refineries in the world. Uh, it's it's, it's, um, um, it's nameplate. Um, you know, uh, so we're excited about what it brings, excited about jobs, excited about technology, excited about the huge investment. Um, and last count from what I hear, more like about six, seven billion. Um, so, so it's a lot of confidence in the, in the economy. But more important for me is that it will create an incentive for others who realize that the, the game um, the game plan for Nigeria has got to change. We cannot continue to remain a country that produces uh, oil vastly every day and simply just put them on board ships and just ship them out. So I'm also pushing oil companies that they've got to begin to look at refining capabilities. If they can't refine themselves, they must invest in other refiners or they must be willing to enter into throughput arrangements with these refiners to be able to uh, give crude to them. And, and you're going to find that compelled by law over a period of time. You know, so that we can get um, uh, um, get to our refining capacity. One of the things that has become obvious with the market play in oil, uh, with the whole OPEC challenges, with the reducing demand for oil, uh, with the growth of self-sufficiency in a lot of the consum uh, consuming nations, that unless you can first internally find a sufficient market, which you can only do through refining, or first regionally find a sufficient market, which you can also do through refining, uh, the future is going to be very bleak. Uh, the, the Gulf countries are doing a wonderful job of that, in kissing their Gulf region, providing self-sufficiency in those dynamics. Africa needs to begin, and as the president of the Africa Apple, I need to drive that message. Joint ventures in refining, uh, joint ventures in shipping capacities, joint ventures in exploration, self-sufficiency in terms of energy and power, uh, and, global, and regional export of some of those commodities. That's going to be the future for Africa's growth, and, and, and I'm looking forward to those challenges.